Hello world. Today's interview is with X Games gold medal winner and world champion skater Chris Haffey. Now this interview is important to me because if you don't know, I've actually been a skater for many years, about 20 years now, and I don't mean skateboarding, I mean inline skating, but grinding on rails, jumping off ledges and ramps, all that crazy stuff that you see skateboarders do, rollerbladers actually do that too, and it's a beautiful, beautiful sport and industry that I've, I'm very happy to be a part of. And Chris is, in my opinion, like you know, the Michael Jordan of skating. You know, he, he has won the X Games, sure, but I mean, he's won basically every competition he's ever gone to, he's in the top two, always. Um, he is an incredible athlete and a really humble guy, so I'm glad he was able to spend some time with us. This is a quick interview, it's less than an hour, and we did it over Zoom because he lives in Australia now, so let's catch up with him and see what the journey is all about. Yo, yo. Yo, what's going on, man? How's everything going? How's it going having a kid? Oh, that's awesome, dude. It's it's like the trippiest thing ever, just watching them become like a little human and like, you know, watching things you do them pick up on and, and stuff like that. And he's getting a, a bit older. Like I take him to the skate park on his bike all the time and he's getting way more confident and cruising around and stuff. And he's, yeah, it's so cool to see, man. Dude, I can imagine. Did you always yeah. want to have kids? Was that something you, you thought about when you were younger or did it just happen as you got married and so on? Yeah, no, for sure. I always just, ima I mean, I had like a really good kind of family life growing up. So it just kind of, it wasn't just like, oh, that's what you do when you grow up. But like, I had such a good kind of family experience, close family that it was like, I'd like to have, you know, a family of my own, you know, when the time's right. Yeah. Was your family, so, yeah. was your family supportive of you when you started skating? Majorly. Yeah. yeah. Like it, it, I wouldn't be, um, where, or I, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did in skating without their support. Like from the jump, man, like I, when I lived in Atlanta, where I started, my dad would drive me 45 minutes to the skate park. Um, like I, either, every weekend or sometimes Saturday and Sunday on the weekends. Wow. Uh, and then when we first moved to California, he like drove me out to Phoenix for a stop at NIS and stuff like that. And this is when I'm like 12 years old. So, you know, it's Jeez. like, uh, you know, well, how, how'd you get into this. skating? Like how, how old were you when you first started? Uh, I was, well, when I, when I first got skates, I was really young, man. Like, uh, Mighty Ducks got me into kind of the roller hockey yeah. side of things. So, um, had skates. I, I can't even remember the first pair, kind of pair of rollerblades I had because I had them so young. Uh, and then I got into ice hockey and then I was friends from my ice hockey team, took them to a skate park. And then it just kind of was a wrap from there. It was just. Yeah. For, for when skate did park. you, when did you know that skating was going to become something serious, like more than just a hobby, it was going to be something you were going to pursue? Uh, I mean, I don't think I made the conscious decision to pursue it per se, but I was just obsessed. Like from yeah. the time I was 12, I was like laser focused. Like the only thing I wanted to do was skate. Like it was like hockey faded away. Any other sport faded away. It was just like, that's what I want to do. And it was, it was like, I wanted to be on skates from the time I woke up to the time I went to sleep. So it was kind of just a natural Thing. And then I was like, of course, I dreamt of being a pro skater, but it's like, that's one of those things where you're like, you can't just decide you're going to pursue that. You know, it's got to be like a, a myriad of things coming together to happen the right way. And I just got lucky, right place, right time. Like we moved back to Southern California, kind of the Mecca and kind of got mixed up with the right people, the right time. And was there a yeah, was there a defining moment you can think of when it when when it felt like a transition happened from it being a hobby to it being real? I mean, I was always real, but I mean, like even from a professional standpoint, like were you competing as a kid? For fun? yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Like that's what I like when I went to that NIS comp. Like the NIS comps, they would have an amateur event the day before, and I would always like go or like before the pro comp, there was an amateur comp, and there was always like three hundred people in it or something like that, and I would always compete in those, and then like. I think the top three or something like that from the amateur thing went into the pro thing. And yeah. like, I had always dreamed of doing that, but like at the time I was doing those, there was no chance. Like I would get like 
I would get like 60th place every time or something like that. But I, I started competing in this contest from like, yeah, age 12. Yeah. Well, I mean, you kind of have to have that passion, right? Because I mean, the amount of effort it takes to succeed at anything, you need to have, you got to want to do it day and night, like all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And did your parents, they see the, the potential of where it was going to go? Or in their mind, did they think you were going to get a real job at some point? I mean, of course, they, they imagined that path. And like my sister was really academically inclined and like she was kind of, they, they always were very education kind of base, like in terms of like, that was what was important. Like, make sure you get the education. You can do whatever you want with it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, which at the time I didn't get, I was like, fuck school. I don't know if I can. <laughs> yeah, like, go ahead. I, just, I just hated school. So I just didn't get it. And I would, I would fight my mom to do my homework and stuff. And I was like, what, you know, do you use this? Tell me how you use this in your life as an adult and I'll do it. And like, it was like, you know, just being like a smart ass and I didn't get it then, but now I do get it. And I feel the same way. It's like, if you get that education, that opens so many more doors to like, you can kind of do whatever you want, but you need that base kind of there to, in order to do certain things, you know, if you want yeah. to be a doctor, for, for I, instance, or whatever. No, of course. But, yeah. There's uh, certain things for sure, but having a base education, I mean, just being educated in general is a good thing. It doesn't oh, always have to equate to school. But. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And, and knowing that now, like I kind of, it's kind of cool. I kind of got my education through experience on the road. Like, so when, when it ch changed was it, it, the thing that happened was I got sponsored and started making money around the same age that you would get your first job. Like, so like, like 15, 16, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. I think I was 15, maybe 16. I think, no, I must've been 15 and it wasn't a lot of money. It was like 300 bucks a month or, or something like that, you know, right, but right. at that age, you know, you don't need a lot of money. So, um, and then it was $600 a month and then it was like, you know, it just kind of kept rolling and then I was like, okay, like he's making money doing this. So like, we can't tell him go get a job cause yeah. he's, it kind of is a job and they saw the drive. Like they knew I was kind of, you know, so driven that, it, and doors were opening and then every time a door opened to kind of push my drive even harder and then that kind of cultivated what you know everything that happened it was like a you know beautiful set of circumstances that all unfolded yeah like one thing snowballs into the next 100 percent, yeah dude i've been watching your sections for so long i was just re-watching your vg20 section which is from mm. like 20 plus years ago and basically, yeah. as long as I can remember, you've always been winning every contest and at the top of the game. Like, what's your mindset around that? I remember you did something in the, in the VG20 profile where you're talking about the theory of pain and the theory of focus. Um, like, were, did you always think of it like as a winning mindset? Did you, were you consciously saying, I'm going to push the sport to the next level? Or was that just a, a happy accident of you having fun? No, it, uh, a little bit of both. Like just from the time I was a kid, I was super competitive, like ultra competitive, like playing soccer as an eight year old. I didn't like losing. So yeah. it was like, you know, it, and some people just, I think are just inclined that way. Like they're just, I, I just like to win whatever I'm doing, whether it's playing cards, playing, you know, whatever, like I just like to win. So that was, that was always my um, kind of, mindset going into a contest was like, well, why am I skating if I'm not trying to win? And yeah. then kind of, I, I mentioned it, I, I did another a podcast and I mentioned something that, that happened contest wise that really sparked something to me. I won two big contests really early on in my career. And that made me, I already believed I could win, but then it happened. So it reinforced that belief yeah. and then it happened again right away. So then when it happened again right away, it was like, okay, why can't I win any contest I enter? And I yeah. think that flipped a, a switch to even another level of self-belief. And then it was just like, it made it easier to just run my program, right? And that's when you do well in anything, I think, is when you're not doing things because of what other people are doing. You're just doing your thing the best you can do it. Yeah. And I believed so much in what I was doing because it worked twice right away that then it made it easier to keep doing that instead of 
the times I wouldn't do good in a contest is when I was paying attention to the tricks other guys were doing. And then I'd go, oh, he just landed this. Like, if I don't do something like this, then I, you know, blah, blah. And get, as soon as I'd get caught up in what other people were doing, it was like a downward, downward spiral. Like, I, I got off my game plan, wasn't doing tricks I was comfortable with, things like that. But um, Yeah, it's almost like the context yeah. becomes different when you're trying to yeah. – think about what they're doing instead of just pushing exactly. yourself and yeah. that belief i'm sure was monumental too i mean like it's one thing to to know you can win it's another thing to then prove it to yourself yeah. like, oh, oh th th this thought that i had it's real <laughs> and then you yeah, do it exactly. again it just cements yeah. that identity yeah and then i would do shit sometimes like i i would tell kato before a, a contest like oh, i'm gonna win that contest like and i think part of that was kind of self-preparation in my head like kind of getting into the right mindset to to win a contest kind of thing not it may come off as arrogant or or whatever if in the wrong context but i think i would do things like that to kind of put my brain in a place where i knew that's what the ultimate goal was going into yeah. the event well, they say that the strongest need is for us to behave like how we identify ourselves, right? So if we keep saying that we can't do something, oh, it's probably not going to work out, then we throw yeah. a half-ass effort and it doesn't work out, then we're like, yeah. see, I told you it wasn't going to work out. Yeah. It's like, yeah, because yeah. we, we went into it with the wrong mindset. But it's like, you do have to kind of claim it in your mind. Yeah. Like, no, this is my intention going into it. Yeah, which is always where I was. And my intention always was to be the best. Like, that was kind of my ultimate goal like i wanted to be the best at anything i did so yeah you know that was why i would do certain things i wanted to be the first person to do certain tricks or you know things like that like that was kind of how i looked at skating i wanted i did want to be the best at it so that was kind of my approach to who, how I who are some of your role models some people you look up to in sports or in life in general oh just in general yeah, I mean, it could be sports people, it could be whatever, just people who... Yeah, I mean, is. Kobe was a huge one, man. Like, Kobe, I grew up, I'm a huge basketball fan, grew up on kind of all sorts of, you know, grew up on Jordan in the 90s, kind of as a young kid, Jordan and Shaq and stuff like that. But then, like, when I really got into basketball, like, properly watching games and understanding the, all the rules and things yeah. like that, it was all Lakers and it was Kobe. And so like, I, you know, I, Kobe was like similar kind of mindset sort of thing. Like the way he was driven was kind of how I felt like I was driven. Yeah. Obviously he was driven on a, a, a completely different level, but. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. It's funny. like the, the industry of basketball might be bigger surrounding it, yeah. but in terms yeah. of, um, you know, athlete for athlete, I would say you're as good at skating as Kobe or Jordan were at what they did. I mean, like, I know you're you're a humble dude, but mm. it, I mean, the numbers don't lie. And like, you're incredible at what you do. Like, you know, I'm saying that like, it, it's been really inspiring me. Like, um, when I hear you say that, it kind of confirms my belief that you have this like humble alpha energy about you. It reminds me of the Jordans of the Kobe's, even like Kanye or like the Muhammad Ali's type of mm mindset of like you have to have this belief in yourself you might be scared every now and then or whatever but it's at some point you have to claim it and say no i'm here to deliver and and that's what drives me you yeah know? well and generally i was pretty quiet like I, I just in general i was quiet shy person like you know semi introverted i, I wouldn't say i'm a full-on introvert but you know i don't think i was ever outwardly conf like overly confident or cocky or whatever i I tended to to let the skating do the talking for me. Like I never wanted to tell you I was good. I wanted you, you to know I was good because you saw it, you know, like, and it's like, you couldn't deny that I'm good if, if I'm doing that. But if I'm just talking shit about how good I am or I'm going to do this or do that, that's one thing I was always about doing it and just letting the skating talk for, for me kind of thing. Yeah. Did you have any career setbacks? Uh, I guess I'll say prior to going to Nitro Circus, were there any specific challenges that you went through physical or whatever that, uh, yeah, that you grew from? I mean, yeah, there was like, yeah, plenty, man. Like injuries for one, obviously everyone's going to go through injuries, but like 
you know, injuries at specific times when it was like, you know, things were on the up and up. And then, you know, I, I remember, I think it was when I broke my leg, it was like, I broke my, I broke my leg and separated the bones in my ankle. So I had to have surgery on my ankle and do my leg. And it was like, I think I was off skates for three and a half, four months, which isn't in the big scheme of things, isn't that long, but it was right when I felt like I was really starting to blow up. So it was kind of, it was when I was filming for, what was it? It was in like, anyway, it was in like 2000 one or two no it was 2003 so it was it was pretty early on in my like exposure to you know and I felt like there were so many people in that kind of generation coming up at the same time that like any time lost was like I was losing footing to like momentum that I had been gaining so I guess that kind of the biggest one injury was and then there was plenty of times like, you know, money wasn't great at times. And then it was like trying to figure out how to get by financially while continuing to do what I love to do and what I wanted to do, which was just skate and film parts and go to contests. Um, so there was always things to figure out. To be honest, I can't even. Did you ever feel like quitting or? Uh, I don't think I ever. I think I loved skating too much to get that far from it based on like a financial thing but there was definitely times i was super frustrated with the financial situation yeah um it was like knowing other guys that were making more money that i felt like i was on the same level at but just their companies had more resources or whatever it was you know I, i do remember things like that but i i can't remember like specific details though because I, yeah, I don't know. I don't like to generally dwell on anything, whether it's bad or good or, but mostly bad stuff. Like I have a hard time thinking back on bad stuff because I generally get past it and keep moving forward. And then I don't like thinking about it. So I kind of forget things happen until yeah. someone says something that then I'm like, oh yeah, shit, you know, whatever. Bro. I feel you. I think most of my memory recall is just all the good stuff that happened in life. Like when something bad happens, like after I go through it, I just end up like redefining it as no, that needed to happen to push me to get over here to learn this lesson. So then it was great. So then as time goes on, all my stories are just like, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. Well, and that's, I think that's the other thing is once you figure out, because I'm I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason kind of thing. And that includes bad stuff. And then you end up learning something from them or or something good wouldn't have happened had that bad thing not happened. Yeah. So then, you know, 2020, you know, hindsight's 2020. And as when you're looking back, you realize those things. And then that bad thing becomes not a bad thing. Like where it was like, Oh, at the time, like even take my broken leg, for instance, I, when I can't, it was my, it was my dominant soul foot. Okay. And I, at the time I was very, I couldn't do a lot of switch tricks. Like I, I did them, but I didn't feel comfortable doing them. And then when I came back from that injury, I was really conscious about not overstressing that ankle. So I started skating switch a lot just to like, because I wanted to be on skates, but I didn't want to be putting pressure on that ankle. And so I became way better at switch skating to the point that, later down the road in skating like I, I could do most tricks both ways because i felt that's amazing that comfortable with it. and that wouldn't have happened if i wasn't in a position where my dominant foot was you know weakened yeah. for an, a, an extended period of time to where i spent that much time skating switch to get that comfortable on it. so then that's when amazing. i look back my god it's a, it wasn't a bad thing it completely changed the future of my skating so it's not yeah. that I don't think about them. I just, I think I realized the lesson or the place it got me. And then it becomes not a bad thing, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And then just like how winning the contest had that that um, mm-hmm. that momentum effect at the beginning, I'm sure the more times we overcome challenging times and then yeah. we find the meaning in them, now the next time a challenging time mm-hmm. comes, we're just like, okay, there's got to you know, be a funny. meaning somewhere. <laughs> I, I remember talking, I was talking to Richie Aza once about this kind of exact thing. And I, 
I remember him saying that it was funny. He was like, when too much good shit happens, I start to get worried. Yeah. Like, um, like something bad's like around the corner. And he's like, and now kind of when bad shit happens, I start to get juiced because I know like some good shit is coming kind of thing. And it, it just speaks, it's such a good mindset. It's so relatable. Like, not necessarily the like every time good shit happens, going, oh, fuck, something bad's going to happen. But the, the mindset of going every time something bad happens, going, oh, sick, something good's about to come because – Right, it's just such a it's such a good way to look at bad shit happening. That happened to me when I moved to LA and started pursuing music videos. Every time after I would have a, a bad breakup and I would be heartbroken, in yeah. that heartbroken phase, I'd get a call to work with like a bigger artist, <laughs> and yeah. it would happen again. Then I would have a new girlfriend, and then we the second we break up, I'd be like, oh, somebody's gonna call me soon. Just waiting, <laughs> just waiting by the phone, just like, yeah. who's gonna call this time? <laughs> it happened so many times that that yeah. that's so funny that Richie said that because I really do feel that. Like when I have consistently yeah. tough days, I'm like, okay, something fantastic's about to happen. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Nitro Circus. Um, B- biggest extreme sports traveling show in the world, I, in my opinion. Um, and you're basically the only person representing an entire sport and culture in it, or you were for a while. How did that yeah. happen? How did you first get connected with them? Because you've always been doing big tricks. You've always been big on street, at park. I mean, you've always been a, a stunt kind of a guy. But how did that yeah, relationship sure. build? Yeah, well, so, yeah, I basically I always had the most fun going as fast and as big as I could. And the thing that I that drew, drew me so much to the mega ramp is it's basically the safest way to do that. It's like, you're going faster than you go to any other trick. You're going bigger than any other time. And then, yeah. but it's relatively safe. Like if you take the night ramp, for example, it's built perfect. Like if you drop in the rolling, don't do anything to mess up and make it off the takeoff, you're gonna land generally like in the sweet spot. It's like engineered yeah. physically to throw you yeah. the right way. Yeah, exactly. So like you, you could just drop in and know, like if it's indoors and there's no wind and all that stuff, no, no other thing, yeah. you know, if I just drop in and go straight, I'm going to land in the sweet spot. So it's like, it just frees you up to be able to do like cool shit and big and, and it just feels cool. Like doing a 360 on it feels awesome. I bet um, just holding that nice and slow in the air. Yeah, and then just like hitting the sweet spot and just like still going that fast. And so I basically that's what drew me to the mega ramp, and then uh, or that style kind of ramp. I basically I connected with uh, with Nitro just kind of randomly. I think what happened is they reached out to Woodward and asked for contact info for a rollerblader. Um, I, I believe it was Richie Velasquez gave them my info and he asked me about it. Like, do you care if I give your info to guys from Nitro? And I was like, yeah, no, for sure. Go ahead. And then I didn't hear anything for months and he, there was no context to it. Like just they're getting your contact info. And then months later I heard from, they're doing a training session. So I went out there and kind of, did did two weeks of training with them on this ramp they were building which was the nitro gigantic ramp and uh we were like making changes to it each day kind of like okay we need more flat bottom or we need more height on the rolling or whatever it was we figured it all out and then uh at the end of the two weeks it was kind of like okay so the the reason we're doing all this is because we're doing a live show in stadiums and the first first one we're doing is in australia it's 12 shows over six weeks um, and we want you to come with us. And I was like, fucking sign me up. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so it was epic, man. It was like the opportunity of a lifetime. And, uh, so I did that. And then how did they, did, how did they treat you? Like, were they welcoming to the, were they seeking a rollerbader in the first place? Like they, yeah, did they, yeah. they so say like we want they, a rollerbader. Yeah. They actively were looking for a rollerblader. Yeah. So and then that's how, when they, that's they, how were they very welcoming to you? Because a lot of people don't know this, but at least back in the day, there used to be some like tribal beef between some of the extreme sports. I mean, you know, it, it was more of a cultural thing, but I mean, individually, people were very nice. Were they welcoming? How, how was the vibe? Yeah, super welcoming. And, and I was kind of nervous about that, to be honest, because they were like the, the MTV show had, ju- I think it, it was just starting its like second season and stuff. So they were like, you know, relatively famous people at the time. And 
I mean, they still are like, but yeah. the main cast and like came from a background of like moto and, you know, all the other action sports. And then I never knew any of guys from the moto industry. And I assumed that they would be like the coolest of cool guys, like, <laughs> you know, hate on skating more than anyone. And, um, no, when I showed up that it couldn't be more the opposite. Like everyone was super welcoming from, from the start. And I mean, granted there was a joke here and there, but like a joke and hate are two totally different things. And like, yeah. you know, I, I never was the type to run around with a chip on my shoulder going, what the fuck did you say? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, I just never had that defensive kind of, mindset about skating and what other people thought about it or anything so I, I didn't care about that and then as soon as I started riding it became a like okay like now we just have respect for you because you're good at what you do and that's yeah. kind of Nitro's whole like mo is like if you kill it at whatever it is you do respect like respect's there you know it's like I don't care if it's on a scooter. I don't care. I mean, look at our Willie. He was like a scooter kid from, you know, from Queensland. Now he's like the star of the show. He has three X Games gold medals in BMX. Like he became like the, wow. like he is now the star of the show for sure. And, um, you know, that's, and that just speaks volumes to how Nitro is. It's funny. We had like some like core skate guys come in who kind of have that kind of beef mentality. Skateboarding is the coolest, blah, blah, blah. And they just didn't fit because Nitro doesn't – Nitro isn't the cool kids. Nitro is like Misfit Island. Like, if that makes sense, it's yeah. like, I don't know, people that are really fucking good at random things or like, <laughs> you know, or the best at what they do but like have the right mentality about – it, I don't know. It's hard yeah. to explain. Well, yeah. I, I feel like when people are really focused and passionate about what they do, there's not much room to be hating on somebody else. Yeah, I, th exactly. I feel like a lot of that was just tribalism back in the day of being like, oh, the way I roll is different than the way you roll. It's like, dude, it's, yeah. we're all at the skate park yeah. just trying to have fun. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so you've been with them for many years now, right? Nit Nitro, you've been... 12 years, yeah. It's, um, Holy shit, it's been a while. Yeah, and I, I actually stopped riding. So I stopped riding the shows in March of 2019. So two years, or over two years ago, almost three years ago now. Yeah. Um, so I, I still work for them now. I'm the full-time athlete manager. That's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, but that, yeah, I stopped riding in 2019. So yeah, I rode... Well 2009 until then so i did 10 years of of touring as a rider dude that must have been so epic just traveling the world doing shows like that so she's doing what she loves yeah it was good times i mean it was it's crazy looking back on it now there was ups and downs and there was like certain tours where they just felt like they wouldn't end and like things like that but you know look, overall looking back on it man it was like the craziest life experience and yeah, so thankful that I got the chance to do it. And, like, the cool part is, is, like, I mean, even just doing that first tour would have been that sick right. like, life experience to look back on. But somehow it kept snowballing and we did it for 10 years. I mean, they're still going. Um, That's but, amazing. But, you know, I got to do it as a rider for 10 years, you know, and did over 300 shows with them and, and stuff like that. So it was, it, it was yeah, best experience ever. <laughs> What did you learn from that tour? The first one? Or, or just in just general, in just, just on that experience of, well, I guess you're still working with them, but. Yeah, far out. Uh, so much, man. I mean, I was 25 when I'm sorry. I'm almost 37 now. So, I mean, just in that age, yeah. you're going to learn so much. And like, it's, it's at the point now where it's, I was so involved with it for so long. It became like my everyday, like, some of the years, dude, we were on tour almost 11 months of the year and stuff like that. So it was wow. like, you know, day and day. So I, things, I just kind of, I can't separate Nitro from <laughs> life for the last 10 years. You know, it wasn't like two months of the year I did the tours and then I would like, look, you know, certain life things would happen in that two months. It was like everything I've learned and done over the last 12 years is like somehow connected with Nitro. So it's, it's hard to distinguish like 
things because I feel like I've grown so much. Yeah, as Yeah, so much of life in general has yeah. happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. funny when you're 25, you feel like you're old and blah, blah, blah. Like, especially in skating, like, you know, when I was 18, I knew I was like, oh, I'm going to have to retire from skating when I'm 25 because I knew guys that stopped, you know, around then. And now looking back, I'm like, fuck, 25, you're like a baby. Like, uh, and so, like, the amount of, you know, learning and life that happens between 25 and 37 is, there's a lot. So a lot. It, a lot happens, it, it, for it. sure. You think you know everything in your 20s, and then you're yeah. like, dude, I didn't know shit. Yeah. Did yeah. you treat now your body? <laughs> Did you treat your body like an athlete uh, growing up? Like, did you like work out, stretch, do yoga, that kind of stuff, or not? Not growing up, and not um, not even when Nitro first started was I doing that. And then I think it was one of those things. Like, that's one of those life things. You get older, and you realize. I think a big part of that is like when you're 20, you can do anything. I was on skates probably eight hours a day or something when I was 20. So that's basically yeah. some form of working out. So I was always just in good shape right. from skating. And it wasn't until I got older and I would do tours and then go home for a month and I wouldn't skate in that month that I started noticing things. Not that I would like gain weight. I'd actually lose weight because mm -hmm. I'd lose muscle and like, I realized, oh, okay. So I, if in this interim, when I'm not skating, I need to do something else to keep my body going, you know? Yeah. And, and so those are things I think you just learn as you get older. So somewhere along the way, I definitely started taking just phys like, uh, my, uh, physical health and my shape I was in more seriously. And I think that's something that just kind of naturally happens. Yeah. Know, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Stretching feels a lot more important to me now. I mean, I always mm -hmm. knew it was important, but now even if I'm just sitting at home editing on my desk, I'm like, okay, I need to take a break, warm up, stretch yeah. my, my hamstrings and everything. It's like sure, so man. many people in their offices are probably stressed out and they just need to stretch and get a massage or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, tell me about golf. I know we only got about 20 minutes left, but you seem like you really love golf. What's, what's the deal with that? Is that a, a, a mental challenge? It kind of reminds Dude, me of almost like a Jordan. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I was, what's funny is I just, so Jordan just did this interview with uh, Steph Curry at the Ryder Cup and they're talking about golf and basketball and he kind of said it better than anyone. Like he basically said when I left basketball, like I needed golf, you know, and that's kind of, I'm the same. Like golf is, it's so, it's such a hard game and yeah. like, when you start getting better at it, you start to like get a, like I got addicted to golf early. Like I played golf through my whole kind of um, skating career, um, but only started taking it more seriously as I stopped skating as often. And then as I was getting more into it, it was like I would choose golf over anything else. Like it was, it's, yeah. it's hard to explain, but it's such a personal challenge. Like, and like, I can go out and play golf on my own and be in my own little world for four hours. And like, you can't really explain it to someone that doesn't play, but like. Do you like that it's an individual game? What's that? Do you like that golfing is an individual game, like skating? Like I, you're, you're technically not going against anybody? Yeah, I do. Well, that's the thing I like the most is that it's you against the course. Like, it's funny. Like a lot of times I'll go play with other people and then I'll come back and people will be like, oh, who won? And I'm like, oh, I don't even know what, like, I may know what they scored, but I wasn't playing them. I was playing me. Cause like, that's the thing about golf. Like, let's say I go out and have a shit day and shoot a score for me feels terrible, but I beat this person cause they played worse. Yeah. That doesn't make me feel good that I beat them cause right. I didn't beat myself. Like I, so that's like my thing is even if you're playing golf against someone else, it doesn't feel the same to win. Whereas I feel good when I beat like a score I've previously had, or if there's a certain hole that I really struggle with and I birdie it or par it or whatever, I'm like, fuck yeah. And like, you know, I get that, like, I don't know, I get the same competitive, you know, thing out. And I, I think it's funny. One of the biggest things I think a lot, so a lot of sports people, right. They, they struggle when they let go of their sport or like move on to the next chapter of life. And 
I think one of the biggest things that people don't realize is like, especially action sports, like when you're moving that fast, it literally is mo uh, meditation. Yeah. Like you can't think like if you think you, you're going to get hurt. So like you're putting your brain into this zone. Like people talk about the zone, like that's just like an ultra meditative place where like your brain isn't thinking it's just doing. Yes. And like, if, if it's, it's such a huge reset, like think about any time you're having a shitty day and like just dropped everything, went out for a skate, had an awesome skate and you, you like come back to those problems that were stressing you out and they don't seem like that big of a deal. And it's yeah. because you're like, got a like, it's like turning your phone on and off and like you you come back, like it, it just, it's like a hard reset for your brain, in my opinion. Yeah. And if you don't find something else that does that, your brain never gets the reset and it just builds and builds and builds and people struggle a lot mentally with things. And I, maybe that's just my kind of theory because golf does that for me, but like the same thing will happen. Like I'll, if I have a shitty day and whatever, and then go out and play a good round of golf, I come back and I'm like, what was I stressed about? Like, you know, I got that like complete re reset kind of thing. Yeah. It's and like, it's, it's like, it's like it breaks the pattern of thinking of focus of meaning. Cause like you said, yeah. to, to skate well or to do anything well, you have to be so in the moment in the zone yeah. that it forces you to be present and everything else goes yeah. and it just yeah. breaks the whole pattern. It's almost yeah. like a, a lot of times when I, if I feel myself getting cranky earlier in the day and I haven't worked out, it, I know that's why, even if it's just as much as like taking my dog for a run or something like yeah. physical activity is so important for, for mental yeah. health. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sweet, man. Dude. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time to chat with me, man. Yeah, no problem, dude. Always happy to catch up with a homie. It, it's been forever, so it's good to see your face. Good to hear your voice. Yeah, likewise, man. What What are things that are taking up your mind now? I know you got the son That's and, and the wife. Congrats on that. Congrats on the beautiful yeah, family. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, family is a big one, man, just because time, like, that's where your time goes. Time and work, uh, or, sorry, family and work um but uh yeah we actually have I've, I've got a second baby coming uh no in three and a half weeks so um good congratulations much, yeah, thank you yeah man but um yeah kids man they, i mean it takes up a lot of time there's a lot of stuff you got to do and just things like you you know i don't know your focus is just there that's what you care about the most and things like that the focus is changing so, so basically, yeah, family, just life, just enjoying life with yeah. my family. This is the main, main goal. So, uh, what are some, uh, what are some messages now, now that your life has kind of come full circle to now you creating the family, right? Um, mm -hmm. which congrats on that, by the way, uh, yeah, what are some messages that you would tell to your younger self? If you could go back to your like, you know, 18 year old self and you could let yourself know some things that you now know that you're older, what would that be? What would you like to share? I mean, pretty much just like, just everything's always going to work out. Like, I don't know. That's, I think back then I kind of stressed too much about the next thing and what was going to happen and need, it needed to happen now. And it's like, it didn't, it didn't need to happen now and everything happened the way it was supposed to. And I mean, get it without getting too deep. I think I, I wouldn't want to go back and say anything because it, I wouldn't want it to change anything that happened because everything happened the way it was supposed to, whether it was good or bad or whatever. And, um, yeah, I think I, and I've kind of adopted that now, as I said, everything's always going to be okay, you know, and it, it will be if you think of it like that and it may take a lot of fucking time to get okay again, you know, if something's really hard or whatever, but you know, if you kind of, I don't know, in my opinion, if the, kind of think like that you know you're always looking for ways to do things and to help things get better or back to how you want them or whatever rather than dwelling on why they're not good yeah. now so i don't know i just think it's a good way to think so i just always think to myself like everything's gonna be okay yeah i feel you you know because our interpretation of life is life yeah you know and two people yeah yeah, the, how you were saying earlier, how 
you think back to when you were 25 and now you're like, oh, yeah, I didn't know shit. Like the more I learn, the the more I know I don't know, if that makes sense. Like I know that I don't know fuck all. Like so <laughs> the best thing I can do is just keep experiencing life and learning as much as I can. But along the way, just doing whatever I can to be happy with my family in in the process. But uh Yeah. 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 I think for me a, a shift I recently adopted is instead of trying to achieve to be happy, I'm here to happily achieve. You know, it's like so many times I feel like every time I accomplish something, my eyes is immediately going to the next thing, and which is good from a progress standpoint, but at some point it feels like you're never achieving enough because there's always that next thing to do. And I used to feel like if I was satisfied with what I had, I would lose the drive for, for the next thing. And now I'm working yeah. on that balance of being grateful. It's like, no, it's dude, come a long way and, and, and I want to enjoy the moment that I have now while I'm creating yeah. that next yeah, thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing is that, and probably for, especially for someone like you with the type of projects you work on is that what probably brings you the most, uh, like, what's the right word? Um, like the way you feel the happiest is when you're being productive on a project. So it's actually the process of doing the whole thing, not the finished product or yeah. the end you know, achievement. Whereas like, it's always good to, you know, to celebrate those things and enjoy those moments. But like, you probably feel the best when you're like right in the thick of. Yeah. Like, Especially when it's the, like in the zone, when I know yeah. what I'm working on and I can see it coming together. It, it feels yeah. great. The release of yeah. a project feels great. It's almost like an orgasm. It's like sure. the project is out. <laughs> and then yeah. and right afterwards, I'm like, okay, on to the next. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I recently started skating again, man. Like, like I never really stopped, but recently started going back and actually reconnecting with some of my childhood friends. And mm. um, like I went back to the original skate park where I first learned to soul grind and all that. Yeah, and it yeah. just reminded me of just, just so much joy that I get from it. You know, like I feel like skating is always going to be a part of my life. Obviously, I've never done it professionally, but I can't imagine a day in the future where I'm not skating. Not even enough to just hit a hit a quick soul grind or a couple of hits on the rail just to just to, I don't know, the whole culture of it transformed me, you know, mm. like through oh, skating, I learned how to film, how to edit, traveling, making friends, making t-shirts, making websites, like, it's such a self-sufficient, independent culture, like, there's no training regimen on how yeah. to skate, you just show up yeah. and do shit, and mm. get better on your own terms, it's... Well, and it's funny, that translates to anything, you see a lot of people who did skate at a high level pretty much do everything they do at a high level because that's what they do is they get in and they do shit and like that's you know you know take someone like mike johnson with the you know the other you know his artwork and the you yeah. know motion he's doing now and all of that it's like it takes that same mentality if you apply that same mentality to anything that you care enough about like magic happens so it's like you see a lot of people who are successful or Vinny with all of his yeah. filmmaking stuff. I mean, the list goes on. There's too many people to name that are killing it at what they do now. It's um, like how think, you do one thing is how you do everything, you yeah. know? And like you said, like you, like the, the stimulation you got from skating and then transferred over to golf. It's like, uh, we just enjoy creating and progressing, creating and progressing. So it, sure. once you take one thing away, you get the next thing. Like during COVID, I moved to this new apartment complex that had a, a really nice tennis court. I never played it before because I thought tennis was like a bougie, yeah. like white people game. I don't know. Like I, I, I had wrong perceptions of it. And then I watched yeah. Serena Williams' masterclass on masterclass.com. Yeah, I was like, yeah, oh, this cool. looks really fun. And then I got yeah. so into it. And now me and my girl just play it every day. It's like, who would have thought I'd be into tennis? But it's like you just yeah. want to get better. It, it, yeah. it's, a, it's just a way of staying happy. Like if I... I either have to be still and grateful or like moving and productive. I can, I can relate. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Well, dude, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me, man. All good, bro. Yeah, I wish you all the best with the family and Cheers, with Nitro, brother. man. And, and and thanks for making such amazing progress in our sport. You know, like I know you're you're a really humble guy, but to a lot of people, you're you are the Kobe, you are the Michael Jordan of of what we do. You know, and, and like so many times before sessions, my friends and I would like watch your sessions, your skates videos. And then yeah. go skating. It's like, okay, let's put on yeah. the happy section real quick. Watch it and be like, yeah. Like it, it's so motivating to watch 
anybody who is at the top tier of what they do. You know, yeah. like it, it's always like I like studying the best. Even if I don't watch a certain sport, I want to see the finals of that sport. Yeah, I want to see you're... people live in excellence, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks man. for the kind words, man. I appreciate it. And definitely the, the section before skating is a sacred thing. So uh, that's a massive compliment. I, I know how that goes. Like I had all the videos and sections I used to watch before I went to, to skate. And I know how, how important they are. So to, to uh, fall into that category is pretty, pretty rad. Hell yeah, man. Well, dude, have a great day. And Cheers, uh, brother. talk to you soon, brother. All yeah, right. have a good one. Thank you. Peace. Okay. Whoa. Look, they can never keep me down. I'm going. And if I ever fail, just know I'll go again. I never quit because I know that every loss may lead to another win. I'm going no. Who the best in this thing? Tell them, yeah, that's me. Tell them, who bring the fire? Say, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me.